Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Shovel Knight. In the last part we did the Plague Knight Exploratorium and now it's time for our next stage, the Iron Whale. Layer of Treasure Knight. If you can't tell by where it was on the world map as well as the general look and the music, this is going to be our water level for the game. With Shovel Knight overall, its water physics are very much heavily based off how Mega Man tends to do it, where you just jump higher and you move, you have a little bit more, less momentum. Moon physics, essentially. And because of that, it's not the type of water level I would think people would outright hate. I'd honestly say this is probably like top three levels in the game for me. With that said, this definitely has some of the more annoying gimmicks depending on, or mechanics rather, depending on your personality. Though I do like the particular snail shells. If you hit them, uh, they'll bounce all over the place, even destroying certain dirt blocks. In fact, uh, in this hallway, there's going to be some dirt blocks on the top in the ceiling. That during this playthrough, it's the first time I've ever actively broken them. <laughs> I have never gotten them before, and I'm very glad I did this time because I got to learn what's up there. Another mechanic you see right off the bat of this stage is there's a unique type of block that is shaped like bubbles. And that slowly disintegrates the moment you step on it. I think it takes roughly a second to two seconds to dissolve all the way. The timing to jump off and onto it is relatively generous all the same though, so you don't need to worry too much if you mess up. With that said, let's go over Treasure Knight's bio. Towering over most of the Order of No Quarter, Treasure Knight is a tidal terror. A loner by nature, he rules the ocean as captain of the Iron Whale, a prototype underwater vessel. With his retractable anchor cannon and an impermeable diving suit, he is at home on the sea floor, where he spends his days hunting down ancient relics. Just keep your hands off his hard-earned lucre, you know, or you'll find yourself floating home. Pros, he can handle extreme physical and mental pressure. Cons, he's greedy, and he's also relatively unintelligible while wearing the helmet. And this is, I believe, the first case where I get to talk about one thing with this game. Uh, obviously, we have boss campaigns. We have King Knight, uh, Plague Knight, and Spectre Knight's campaigns. But I believe every other Order of No Quarter member did have gameplay concepts made in case they got their own campaigns. And the interesting thing about uh, uh, Treasure Knight was that he was going to be able to use his grappling hook as an anchor that could be used to reel yourself into platforms, in a way similar to what King Knight's own dash build ended up being. Uh, he was also would have been able to pour water out of his suit as a just short range attack, but he added a unique mechanic in that if he ever ran out of money, it was game over in the stage. But he also had an attack that used uh, shots of projectiles at the cost of money, so he needed to balance things out carefully. Uh, it sounded interesting, but the others just won out overall. As I, I think it was put up just to like I forget if it was backer vote or just fan vote uh, to see who the other three campaigns would be, to the point where even, I believe, the Black Knight and Enchantress were options? And I think uh, Black Knight was just intended to be, uh, I want to say, just like a hard mode version of the game, something along those lines, which I guess we already kind of got in New Game Plus anyway. More on that later. Again, I know I keep saying that, but uh, I'll have time to talk about that. Don't worry. Now, something I also didn't go over last part is we fought a couple of the optional bosses, uh, Breeze, Baz, and Mr. Hat in particular. And all of them do have official bios in the game like the knights, they're just missing the pros and cons. For instance, Reese, uh, a group of evil knights is terrorizing the countryside. Reese, Seatland is on the scene. This plucky young adventurer travels the land helping people in need and following his own invented knight's vows. But which of these knights are good and which ones are bad? Rees is a bit naive, but always well-intentioned. How will his twin crystal boomerangs fare against a shovel blade? And I, I was actually laughing earlier today, because I'm finally playing through Indivisible on my spare time. And uh, his, he's just there. <laughs> I forget that's because uh, the creator of that character also did like uh, enough donation for Indivisible to get his character in there. Or if it's because of the Shovel Knight crossover that game has. I guess I'll find out later on. Whereas Baz's bio... The storm is coming. With a fearsome rope whip and the toughest looking armor around, one might think that the traveling warrior Baz would be a shoe in to join up with the Order in a Quarter. Imagine his surprise when he was rejected. Now he roams the land, taking out his anger on passersby. Could he ever prove himself strong enough to earn the title of Baz Knight? As we've seen, uh, no. <laughs> and finally, Mr. Hat is obsessed with hats, but for good reason. Although he wears a helmet, each hat that he places atop his head gives him the powers of that hat's owner. Mr. Hat can switch from a charismatic, foppish dandy to military genius in a moment, and he takes great pride in his varied fighting styles. Lately, though, there have been rumblings of an even greater warrior who wields a shovel blade, one with a wonderfully blue horned helmet. All right. 
Now we're in the part of the game, though, or the stage, where we are just straight up underwater for a lot of it. And uh, the gray versions of the little shelled enemies that we've seen a couple times now, the big gimmick or difference with them in the red ones is that the gray ones just can't be destroyed at all. They're essentially invincible pieces. And our mini boss for this stage is a giant anglerfish, but we actually have a bit of a Mega Man 2 dragon chase here. We have to avoid it and not die to what's beneath us. I believe just touching the fish here is just damage, though, not instant death. And once we reach these platforms, the boss fight begins. The weak point is the obvious glowing lights in the chest. However, you cannot do your usual strategy and jump on the chest to do damage. You, it, it, you just bounce right off of it. So what you need to oft, often end up doing here is just damage it itself by throwing a projectile at it or bounce off the fish and then just do like a standard shovel, knight stri uh, shovel blade strike to damage it. My personal bias here is to get the gray armor at the armor outpost though, the dynamo armor I believe, and t bounce off it twice and then come back down for a full two units of damage with the charged uh, shovel strike you can get with that. But that said, that is also our Chester box for this uh, particular stage. Eels alive, I haven't had a ride like that in ages. I still, I think I'm gonna be sick. Anyway, I'm about to drop another great gear piece. Here we get the throwing anchor. It's pretty self-explanatory. It is the axe from Castlevania. You throw it upwards in an arc, it does decent damage. Uh, it's really good against any boss fight that's generally gonna be above you, uh, particularly the last night I tend to take on this game, it's really good against. But it's also just good against trying to go through platforms that are above you. Uh, that's one thing I like about these relics in this game. While they might have a different playstyle around them, you can easily use any of them to take care of enemies who are in hard to reach places. In different ways, mind you. With that said, this stage has easily one of my least favorite enemies in the game. And it's the one I just killed, that weird looking eel mage? Uh, the way they work is that they'll just float around on a specific altitude, but when you're near them, they'll start throwing a bunch of little, almost tadpole-like attacks at you. And it acts as a shield for them as well, which means, unless you use, like, the throwing anchor in particular, because that'll just ma uh, go right through them. They can be very hard to damage without getting hit yourself, and even then, in the case that they're in reach, you're either gonna accidentally take out the shield first and then get hit, or they're just gonna be out of your reach, period. Thankfully, I think there's only, like, three or four of them in the stage, and only, like, maybe five or six in the game, period? At least in Shovel of Hope. But they're still really annoying. And here, we, uh, we've had it for the, for the last screen, too, is the next mechanic for this stage. We have little torpedoes that act as platforms. Hit the red lever to shoot them off, and then, well, you, you go with them. Hey, they, they're platforms. With that said, uh, if you're on them until the end, I don't think you take damage, you'll just straight up fall. But it's very easy to accidentally misjudge your jump like that and end up dying. They're usually located either right above spikes or bottomless pits. Uh, I don't think there's a single one in this stage that isn't technically required unless you're playing New Game Plus and have one of the later relics in the game. Whenever you have to deal with them being with red levers though, uh, sometimes they'll do little timing puzzles like you see here where you just need to get yourself into that corridor. Other times it's just relatively safe. I recall some of the expansions doing generally more dangerous things with these. I think. It's also one of the three places in the game I'd say ducking might come in handy. And now we have the final main mechanic from my memory. Uh, anchors. You get close to them, they drop down like the chandeliers in King Knight stage, and they will damage you, I believe. With that said, the top of each anchor acts as a platform. Meaning, if you position yourself just right, you don't need to worry about them as a hazard at all. In fact, they'll end up helping you. To the point where you're, you're, you're required to do that right here. The biggest danger here is, I would say, not the anchors, but the eel mage. Just because uh, this is an annoying enemy placement. <laughs> There's not too many enemy placements in this game. I would say, ow, or outright, like, uh, screw you, die placements. Usually, they're pretty smart about where enemies are put to the point where... They're either getting around them is the challenge, or they're just there for extra money. There's never, there's seldom a case of they put this enemy here just to dick with you. The eel mages might be one of the few cases where that is still true. <laughs> uh, at least in Shovel of Hope. I recall King of Cards doing a bit of that. Spectre Torment technically did, but that game has a mechanic around that anyway, given that enemies act as extra platforms for you, technically. Uh, same with King of Cards. 
I can't remember what uh, from what I played of Plague of Shadows if that's true there. I don't recall it, but I also haven't seen, like, the latter half of the game. <laughs> so, uh, whoops. With that said, we are getting close to the end of the stage. I think we only have maybe one more actual platforming room here. And it's one where you need to be on your best attack timing. Because uh, what we're going to have happening here is... The torpedo platform is the main thing here. But we have to make sure we time our shovel blade so we take out all these destructible walls in the way. Otherwise, uh, you die. <laughs> there is no way around it. With that, it's time for Shovel Knight himself. And I almost did the weakness thing again. Man, I'm used to saying that in Mega Man. My gems, my vessel, my ocean. Your very presence tarnishes. You want to lay claim to the sea itself? Your greed knows no bounds, Treasure Knights. Your hands are no less dirty. Even now, others are paying for your avarice. Let us duel, winner take all. Treasure Knight uses his grappling to his advantage to either tilt himself to a wall as an attack, or to the ceiling. When he does it to the ceiling, he's often going to pound down on the golden floor to create a giant shockwave effect. Later on in the fight, I believe he throws some caltrops around that'll just explode and leave a little damage effect. And he can also spawn a chest in the center of the stage that creates a whirlpool that sucks everything around it into it. So you need to fight that current, otherwise you're going to take some pretty decent damage from my memory. With that said, Chaos Sphere, again, kind of game-breaking in the right instances. Treasure Knight Stage... I'd say is like top three levels in the game, like I said before, because I just love well done water stages, and I feel that is one that is such. There's some annoying enemies in there, but Treasure Knight himself isn't that much of a deal, in my opinion. With that, only one knight remains in this portion of the game, but I believe the next thing we're gonna do is completely unrelated to that, because you might notice on the far right of the screen, there was a question mark uh, area. That's gonna be where we go next. Let's see here. Oh, you found a thousand leagues below! Another masterpiece from my foreign colleague. She was serenading adventurers when I was still in Bard College. Bards have friends, who knew? D&D would tell me otherwise. Now, there's also one thing I completely forgot to do, and it's this. After I beat Spectre Knight. I love that song. It's only like, what was it, 20 seconds long, maybe? But it's just so damn catchy. I think I just put my mic there. Sorry about that. Now, this is a point especially where I recommend spending a little bit of gold, but don't spend all the excess you have. Let's see. Oh, you found Watch Me Dance! You should write a Tarantella! Last time I take advice of a painter. I don't get that. <laughs> uh, I recommend spending... Enough to the point where you have around 5,000 gold, I believe it is. As that's going to be the best way that you're going to be able to do what I'm going to do in the order I'm doing it. Uh, you can maybe have around 3,000 total, because there's going to be another uh, gem area that usually shows up after this that gets you through the treasure knight mechanics. But you're going to want to at least have 5,000 gold for next part, in the case you're doing things in the same order I am. You could also wait until after the next night, no problem. Because over there on Treasure Knight stage is what I'm talking about. This is, without a doubt, the treasure encounter that I always do the worst at, uh, so to speak. As, first off, it's very easy to miss a lot of the money here just in this first room because of how the blocks break apart. But if you are just miss time a jump, you're going to miss most of the treasure here just because you're constantly falling. And if you miss a jump, that means you're missing out on that entire screen's worth of treasure. Which sometimes isn't too much, but sometimes you probably miss like maybe two or three hundred by missing that jump in particular. Thankfully, they still give you enough that if you time your jumps well enough, if you're like around maybe four or three thousand, you should still comfortably make it to the five thousand I'm saying you need. In fact, it's kind of a godsend this showed up when it did. 
because uh, then I would have had to do a mole night next, and while I'm gonna do that anyway, I'd rather do things in the order I'm gonna do them. But with that, I'm gonna need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part six, we're gonna be delaying heading after our next night, because there's a little bit of a bonus area we can do right now. See you guys then.